Hello out there in Radio Land. This is Michael. This is the Street Preachers Podcast. The podcast where we are bright-eyed and bushy-tailed. Oh, except for the tail part, because it would be just kind of weird. You know, along those lines, one of my uh, sons asked me recently uh, what I would do if I woke up, you know, tomorrow morning with a tail. And I told him the first thing I would do is go buy new pants. <clears throat> you got to think about these things. You got to be practical in your in your mutations. Well, today's uh, venture into podcast uh, whateverness probably qualifies as axe grinding, but I may, I don't know. I mean, some people would call it axe grinding, but that doesn't mean that it really is. The fact is, um, words mean things, um, and to a certain extent, the the way you when you start diluting a language, it leads to the um, the dilution of the ideas behind that language, and, and like I know I'm way up here in the in the whatever. So, um, I, and I don't I don't think uh, there's there's all sorts of thoughts about this sort of thing. I don't think that language begets ideas. Uh, in other words, just because we don't have a word for a thing, it uh, doesn't mean that no one can conceive of that thing. Uh, I mean, I think it actually works the other way around. You come up with a word to describe a thing. You don't just come up with the thing to describe a word. Um, that's that's just backwards. Um, there there are certain schools of linguistic thought and 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 that sort of thing that uh, they they'll say, for example, they will say that the ancient Greeks, I think it was ancient Greeks, didn't have a word for blue, so people didn't see blue. Well, that's ridiculous. I mean, think about it for a second. They look they look up at the sky, and they may not have a word yet for that color that's in front of them, but that color is still there. Reality is still a thing. And and language exists uh, so that we can express ideas and so that we can we can have names for things. People people love to name things. I don't know if you ever thought much about this, but um, you know, if you have a dog, there's no reason uh, for that dog to have a name. It could just be, you know, dog. Um, but if you have two dogs, it could be you know, dog one, dog two. But 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 people don't people aren't content with that. People like to name things. People will call it Fido or Spike. We got we got three dogs. We got Cookie. And we got Gypsy, Jetpack, Sparkles. Uh, none of this was my idea. We've got Cookie, and we've got Gypsy, Jetpack, Sparkles, and uh, and then we've got uh, uh, Chip, who has a much longer name that I've never bothered to learn because I don't really like that dog. But anyway, human beings assign names to things. Human beings, language is a human thing. It's not a you know the animals, uh, the birds may sing to each other, but they don't you know have sentences. Uh, the dolphins may talk to each other, but I don't think they're Talking in the same way that I'm talking to you. Uh, language is a function of uh, one of the attributes, the ability to speak and the ability to have words. The ability to, to take an idea inside your head and formulate that idea outside your head is, is one of those attributes of God that got passed on to the human race and that we still retain. And I'm getting way off track right from the beginning. But but my point in all this is that words mean things. And, you know, if you want to look at it from a political perspective, you have, uh, you know, the communists and the progressives, which are pretty much the same folks. Um, they tend to want to control language. A lot of the cancer cultural, a lot of the multiplicity of pronouns, a lot of the uh, political correctness and speech laws and speech codes are an attempt by people of a certain ideological stripe to control language because they think to control a language is to control the, the thoughts. And if, if you ban a word for a thing, then, you, then that thing goes away. If you were to ban the word freedom, then no one would ever occur to anyone to be free. Uh, no, no, uh, that's just silly. Um, so I will not uh, side with the commies on on this or any other thing. Yeah, you know, I don't, I don't, I don't hate homosexuals, and I don't hate Wiccans, and I don't hate devil worshippers. I kind of hate communists. Once again, way off track. But I don't, I don't, I'm not going to side the communists on, on this or anything else. Um, the, in, 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 the, in that uh, the, 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 the word is preceded by, or the, the, the thing is preceded by the word. Uh, I, I will, con- but I will concede that language influences uh, thought, and that's why you dumb a population down. That's why you try to. You can't get rid of an idea, but you can steer people's thoughts by the words that you use and the words that you encourage them to use. That's fine. That's that's how propaganda works. That's how political correctness works. That's how that stuff works. Uh, one of the benefits of reading old books, uh, you know, an old book uh, is not the same as like a, a a blog. You can you can slam a blog out in ten minutes and hit send and send it out in the world. I've gone back and looked at things that I've I've written and it's just been an embarrassment. Uh, grammatical errors that I've missed and spelling errors that I missed. It's just just terrible because it's so quick. You can just throw it out there. Uh, social media posts, which I don't have any social media, but if I had a social media account, thingamajigger, 
then obviously I would, you know, the same issue. It, it's just, you can instantly bam. But the, 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 the work that goes into putting out a book, uh, especially back in the day, whenever the day it was, um, you had to really, your ideas had to congeal. They had to, they had to, you know, you had some time to chew on what you were going to say and then how to say it. And then, and there's just, just, just a way more involved process. So when you sit down and read older books, one of the uh, benefits of that uh, is that uh, clever people in times past took complicated ideas and they put them into words. And then when I sit down and I read those words, my brain has to sort of process those words and then I have to think about them. And, and then, you know, I have to think about their complicated ideas. It's a brain muscle thing. And uh, without that, I'd be out of practice for, for thinking complicated ideas, perhaps. And and that's, you know, you, you, when you, I read apparently a lot more than the average person. I don't know. Um, this is just a, a conclusion I've come to from from talking to other people. I've read, you know, thousands and thousands of books, probably uh, very easily thousands. And uh, I mean, you know, 60, 70, 80 a year, depending on what's going on. Uh, and these aren't books. These aren't little leaflets. These are, you know, bigger books. Um, and so I don't think most people read, I don't think most people think, and I think those things are connected. All this to say that words mean things, and when you dilute a language, you do dilute the <clears throat> the thought process that goes into that language. So, so why does that matter? Why, why, why am I beating this particular dead horse? Because I want to talk about 1 Corinthians 13, commonly and <clears throat> mistakenly, Referred to as the love chapter. The love chapter. Now, uh, when you get your King James Bible, in fact, and I'm pretty sure, I think, I have not checked them all, but I think that every time, every English translation except the King James uh, uses the word love in 1 Corinthians 13. And um, it's my contention that the King James Bible is, is perfect, it's infallible, uh, it's inerrant, it is inspired. The uh, Bible says over in Timothy that uh, Scripture is given by inspiration, and not that it was given by inspiration. And if you believe you have inspired originals, that all you have now is translations of those inspired originals, you could make the case that we could change a word here and we'll change a word there. But if you believe that you have the right words, which I do believe we have, then it's up to you to understand these right words that you have. And I'm going to just chase one quick little uh, side quest kind of thing here just to establish a principle. Because I understand, and sure, I mean, I live in the same world you do. Um, I understand that when you talk about charity and love and, and things like that, that charity, when, when you say charity, uh, people think that's where you go to, you know, to, to get free stuff. A charity is a place that gives away money or it's a place that gives away uh, food or gives away clothes or something. I understand that's how we use the word now. Um, and so I understand people to say, well, we need to update your Bible in order to, you know, reflect the current use of words. Well, there's a, there's a lot of problems with that. Um, and I really don't want to go down the road of Bible translations and manuscript evidence, although I could. Um, well, so one of the problems <clears throat> with, with, with that is um, that there is a, actually a Bible way to handle out-of-date words. And I'll just First Samuel 9, uh, we're going to look at this real quick. In First Samuel 9, there's a, <laughs> There's a story of early life, uh, early time in the life of Saul. You see his appearance uh, in verse 2. And it says, no among, among the children of Israel, a goodlier person than he, from his shoulders and upward, he was higher than any of the people. And he go down to verse 9, his his father's, uh, uh, they, he lost some asses, and, and he sends Saul out to go look for him with one of the servants. And they get over there in uh, verse 9, I believe it is. Uh, says the servant, I'm sorry, verse 8. So they're trying to find these things, and uh, and uh, well, it's verse six. And he said to him, "Behold, now there is a, in this city a man of God, and he is an honorable man. All that he saith cometh surely to pass. Now let us go thither, peradventure he can show us our way that we should go." Then said Saul to his servant, "But behold, if we go, what shall we bring the man? For the bread is spent in our vessels, and there is not a present to bring the man of God. What have we?" Uh, and you go down to verse, uh, I'm just going to read verse 8. And the servant answered Saul again and said, Behold, I have here at hand the fourth part of a shekel of silver that I would give to the man of God to tell us our way. Verse 9 says, Before time in Israel, when a man went to inquire of God, thus he spake, Come and let us go unto to the seer. For he that is now called a prophet was before time called a seer. So now sometime between the uh, between the time these events happened and the time that someone wrote 1 Samuel, uh, the word 
uh, seer had gone out of gone out of usage, and the word prophet was put out there that meant the same thing. I don't know if you guys can hear these goats of mine that are just hollering like they're being slaughtered, and I have no idea why, and I'm just not even going to stop to talk to them. We have goats, I'm not sure why. Anyway, so the time between, you know, I, I turned them loose and let Saul into the servant go look for them. Um, so in the time between the, the time that this happened and the time that, it, that, that the, the incident is recorded, it is, uh, the word had passed out of usage. And so, so rather than what you'll see here, and, and you're looking down here in verse uh, 10, says, Then Saul said to the servant, Well said, come let us go. So they went to the city where the man of God was. And as they went up the hill to the city, they found young maidens going out to draw water and said to them, Is the seer here? So what you have in your Bible is you have an archaic word inside your Bible text. Like it was archaic at the time that the, that the word was being written. And so rather than change that word with something else, they stop for like half a verse. They explain to you this is the same thing as this word that we use now. And then they go right back to using the old word. So you're going to say charity is a better thing for 1 Corinthians 13 because charity now means, uh, you know, giving stuff away, humanitarian kind of stuff. And so we should use a different word. Now, I think we should follow the Bible example. We should tell people what charity means in the Bible, and then we can and, and co compare it to whatever we have now, and then go right back to using the same word, the same old word, because that word is the correct word. And so that's my little rabbit for that. Um, so the love chapter in 1 Corinthians 13, you know, uh, uh, somewhere around our house, I was trying to find it the other night, and I just... I, I get easily distracted, obviously. If you can listen to this, you can tell I get easily distracted. But somewhere around here, we've got a little cross-stitch thing uh, that somebody gave us as a wedding gift. And it's got 1 Corinthians 13, and it has the word love instead of the word cha uh, charity. And, you know, I, the girl meant well. And, and if you've ever known anything about cross-stitching, it is it is it looks like. I've never done it because, you know, I'm, I'm a dude. Uh, but it looks like the hardest thing in the world to do. It just looks like like you're building a universe one grain of sand at a time. It just and so the fact that she sat down and and uh crossed it to sing for us as a gift to us at our wedding, I'm very appreciative of that. But but she the, the verse is wrong. The, the passage is wrong. Um and so she didn't know any better. You know, she didn't know any better. She she never looked into this to the degree that I have. Uh, I have heard men who claim to believe the King James Bible who will then uh swap out the word charity with love when they're when they're teaching out of first Corinthians 13 and they do that i think i'm going to give them the benefit of that i'm going to say they do that as a way of explaining the idea uh, of the chapter but the problem is they're wrong they're wrong the king james bible is right and i'm pretty sure i can prove it so let's 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 try not to get bogged down but let's let's define love or at least, you know, lay out some parameters or characteristics of love and then lay out some parameters and characteristics of charity. And then we'll compare the two and we'll see which one um, more accurately reflects what's going on in First Corinthians 13. So let's go to John 13. John 13. I don't know if you guys have this problem. I stick things in my Bible all the time. I've got uh, just all kind of stuff jammed in the pages and everything. And then you're trying to flip through it and just it jumps past where you're trying to go because you've got a, a thing there. John 13, uh, look at verse 35, I believe it is. <clears throat> Sorry, verse 34. A new commandment I give unto you that ye love one another as I have loved you, that ye also love one another. And by this shall all men know that you are my disciples if you have love. Uh, one for another. And so one of the things you see right from the beginning uh, in, in this passage is that love, uh, it, it's, it's, it's one of the hallmarks of, uh, of, of, of the Christian life, but it's, it's <clears throat> one of the hallmarks is it's, it's baseness. It is, it is, it is step one on the, on the, on the rung of being saved. It is, it is, there's probably a better way to explain that. It is the most basic quality ascribed to a believer. In fact, it is such a base quality uh, that in First John three, uh, you have a, a passage. Where, oh, let's, let's look at it. Let's look at it. It's worth looking at it. I, I, I act like I'm in a hurry out here, but I'm not. Um, it, it takes time to go through things. It takes time to think about things. First John three. Oh, I was a problem finding the Johns. Uh, First John three. 
Where does it say it at? Uh, for this is the message you've heard from the beginning, that we should love one another. So that's John 13. That's from the beginning. Uh, not as Cain, who is that wicked one, slew his brother, for for slew him because his own works were evil. Uh, and it says, we know that, we, uh, verse 14, we know that we have passed from death into life because we love the brethren. He that loves not his brother abideth in death. So, so love as a concept, as, as, a, as, a, as a thing, uh, it's such a base thing. It's, 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 it's the lowest rung. It's the low hanging fruit of the Christian life. It is so basic and so, so standard issue uh, that uh, according to First John, if you don't have love, you might want to check up on your salvation. You might not even be saved. And uh, you look a little bit further over in Second John, chapter 1, it's the only chapter. Grace be with you and, and uh, yeah, grace be with you, mercy and peace from God the Father and from the Lord Jesus Christ, the Son of the Father, in truth and love. I rejoice greatly that I found out thy children walking in truth as we received a commandment from the Father. Now I beseech you, thee, lady, not as though I wrote a new commandment unto thee, Right, John 13, she's had it for a while. But that which we had from the beginning, that we love one another. So it, it, is, a, it, is, it is ground zero of your Christian life. You get saved, you get the ability to love the brethren. You don't have to be smart to love. Uh, you don't have to be clever to love. You don't have to be a Bible scholar to love. You, you, don't, have, you don't have to be mature to, be a lo- to love. You just have to be saved. It is the, it is the, is the hallmark. Uh, of of the saved life, without it you don't have salvation. Without and if you find that you hate your brethren, the Bible says you ought to, you ought to consider the fact you might not even be saved. So so if I had a young Christian that had no love for the brethren, then I would I would I would say they're not saved. That's why when I knock on a guy's door, man, I don't want to get chased down this road. Here we are. When I knock on a guy's door and the guy tells me, uh. That, you know, he got saved X number of years ago at a revival meeting or uh, X number of years ago when somebody came and knocked on his door and led him in a prayer or X number of years ago when he heard a televangelist on the TV and he he put his hands on the TV screen to have a point of contact. What are these weird stories that people tell? And then that man has 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 uh, since the time that he, quote unquote, got saved. Uh, he has exhibited uh, no love towards the brethren, no desire to be with the brethren, no hunger for the words of God, no no desire to tell anyone about what Jesus Christ supposedly did for him. I have a hard time with swallowing the fact that that man saved. Now, take that for what it's worth, okay? I'm just some guy in a shed. Take that for what it's worth. But there you are. And so, uh, like I said, it... it, it one of the attributes of love, the primary attribute of love, according to First John 13, is its base quality. But let's look at charity for a second. Second Timothy 3. Second Timothy 3. It's in here somewhere. I saw it. Now the dogs are barking and the goats are crying and I don't know what's going on out there. Second Timothy three. Bible says starting at verse seven. Yeah, yeah somewhere in here. Uh, Second Timothy, that would help. Yes, we we record these in one shot and we keep all our technical errors, and that's because we're honest, and plus because we're too lazy to record something over and over again, and we're too lazy to edit things. Uh, 2 Timothy 3, verse 8. We'll start there in verse 7, actually. Ever learning and ever will come to the knowledge of truth. Yeah. 8. Now, as Jamzy, Jam, Jannies and Jambres withstood Moses, so do these also re- resist the truth. Men of corrupt minds reprobate concerning the faith, but they shall proceed no further, for their folly shall be manifest to all men as theirs also was. So, Jannies and Jambres are given as an example of foolish men. And there, there, there's, there's men that are, that are mentioned in verse, uh, you know, uh, one, two, three, four, five, and six. And, and there's, those guys are, are related there being the same as genius and Jambres. And then genius and Jambres are presented as being, you know, the base model for the per, sort of person you don't want to be. And then, and then Paul contrasts his life with the life uh, of, of the people he just mentioned. Verse nine or yeah, uh, sorry, verse 10. 
But thou hast fully known my doctrine, my manner of life, purpose, faith, long-suffering, charity, patience, persecutions, afflictions, which came unto me at Antioch, at Iconium, at Lystra, which persecutions I endure, but out of them all the Lord delivered me. Now, so let me just, let me just, so here's the contrast, okay? You have carnal, shallow people that you don't want to be like on one side. And on the other side, you have mature Christians who've been serving the Lord for decades. On the other side, Paul counts himself as among that number. And one of the attributes he gives to himself and the other, the people that were traveling with him is charity. Okay? Just stick a pin in that. Let's take a look at Titus. Titus 2. The Bible do, do say... But speak thou the things which become sound doctrine, that the aged men, okay, these are the older guys in the church, they could be older in the Lord, they could be physically older, just, just aged men. Be sober, the aged men be sober, grave, temperate, sound in faith, in charity, and in patience, okay? So, once again, older people, been at this for a while, one of the attributes that are given to them is charity. Second Peter. I thought we were just there. Maybe I'm thinking of something else. Second Peter 1. The Bible do say, uh, and uh, verse 5, and besides this, beside this, this being verses uh, 4, for, verse 3 and 4, giving all diligence, add to your faith virtue, and to virtue knowledge, and to knowledge temperance, and to temperance patience, and to patience godliness, and to godliness brother kindness and to brotherly kindness charity for if these things be in you and abound they make you that ye shall neither be barren nor unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ so there's a stepping stone laid out that once you have this attribute you work on this next attribute and you work on this next attribute and I know there's there's a whole message right there in that but uh so you so you start off with a with a faith and then you add to that faith, you add virtue. You, know, you let the faith that Jesus Christ gave you and the indwelling Holy Spirit, you let that 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 combination clean you up some. And your virtue knowledge, it was about time you learned the Bible. And uh, uh, and knowledge temperance. Temperance is, is, you know, you're not a hothead. You're you're even tempered. When a man says, I, lo I lost my temper, temper means strength. I tell, the temper of a blade is the strength of that blade. So if a man loses his temper, that means he has shown his weakness. See, we use words, and we use them, and, and we don't sometimes think about what we're saying. Don't chase it. Okay. Uh, and so temperance and temperance patience, right? So you don't lose your cool all the time, and now you're patient with people. And the patience, godliness, that's always a good quality to have. And the godliness, brotherly kindness, and the brotherly kindness, charity. So the top of this pile of things you're trying to learn and 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 by 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 yielding yourself to the Holy Ghost and exercising the disciplines of a disciple of Jesus Christ, you're trying to build yourself up until you have charity. Uh, in fact, we'll give we'll take one more stop here. Colossians, uh, Colossians three. So so far we've established that. Love is, is the baseline. That's something everybody gets. And then there's the other things you got to apply yourself to get a handle on them. The Bible says, God hath given every man a measure of faith. And that's because it takes faith. Without faith, it's impossible to please God. So God gives you some things from day one. And then those other things, these other things are all available to you, but you, it's going to take you a while to figure out how to access them. It's going to take you to figure out a way how to apply them. It's going to take you a while to figure out what to, where these things are in life and where these things are in the scripture. Colossians 3. But that's contrasted with charity. Charity is always showed every time it's showed in your New Testament. It's shown uh, as 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 the mark of a but not of a baby Christian, but of a mature Christian, someone who's been at this thing a while, and it's accompanied uh, by other other qualities that come before it, and it is the it is the the, the cherry on the Sunday of your Christian growth. Colossians three, I said, verse twelve. Put on therefore as the elect of God, holy and beloved, uh, bowels of mercy, kindness, humbleness of mind meekness, long-suffering, forbearing one another, and forgiving one another. 
If any man have a quarrel against any, even as Christ forgave you, so also do ye. Verse 14 says, And above uh, all these things, put on charity, which is the bond of perfectness. Now, I haven't done this study in this podcast now, but you should run all the references on perfectness and perfection and the word perfect and realize that perfect does not mean sinless. Perfect means complete. And there's still some uh, some some spots in the English language where we still use perfect. You know, when you're writing a book, when you get the final edition of it, it's the perfect edition of it. It doesn't mean sinless. It means complete when you're finished with the book. When you've done all your editing, when you've cut all the parts out and added new words, that, that's the perfect edition of that book. And so, uh, according to verse 14, charity is the bond of perfectness. So you could say, you know, you, a man has really arrived in his Christian life when when he ha- when he has when he has charity not when he has love not when he's forbearing you should have those things but they're those things are things you develop along the way and when you when you really got a grip on things when you really are somebody that other people can look at and uh and as an example uh then then you have charity the attributes of charity are also all the attributes of maturity and then it's not presented as something you get it on day one like love Charity is presented as something you get after after you've been at this thing a while. Charity is the sign that you've arrived. And so, so now that we've established these two different words, which are different things, although they have a, a lot in common. I mean, you know, a dog has legs and a cat has legs and a dog has fur and a cat has fur, but that doesn't mean a dog and a cat are the same thing. It just means they have some things in common. Charity and love have some things in common, but charity and love are two different things. One of those things you get at the beginning of your Christian life, and the other you develop somewhere along the way, and you carry it forward into the rest of your Christian life. So since we now understand, hopefully, 27 minutes into this, uh, that uh, that these things have some similarity, but, they are the, but they're not the same, let's take a look at 1 Corinthians 13. I'm just going to go through here, and I'm just going to ask some questions, and you think about it, okay? Okay, here we go. 1 Corinthians 13. Here's the big enchilada. Now, though I speak with the tongues of men and of angels and have not charity, <clears throat> I am become a sounding brass or tinkling cymbal. Let's hit the pause button. Would you expect a baby Christian to have those attributes? Or would you be surprised if a baby Christian had those attributes and you'd be equally surprised if an older Christian didn't have those attributes? I mean, you know, you you, you see a one-year-old that can't drive a car. I mean, that's one thing. No one expects a one-year-old to drive a car. But if you've got a 30-year-old that can't drive a car, then, you know, that, that kind of sticks out in your mind. Verse 2. And though I have the gift of prophecy and understand all mysteries, and would you expect a baby Christian to have the gift of prophecy and to understand all mysteries? Would you expect a baby Christian to have all knowledge and, and all faith so he could remove mountains? And Would you expect a baby Christian to have that? Well, of course not. You're, you'd be an idiot if you expect it. That's unfair to put that burden on somebody who just got saved or someone who's never learned any Bible. But a man that's a man in, some, in my situation that's been saved uh, 27, 28 years, whatever it is, uh, 1995, 2022, so 27 years. There'd be something wrong with me if I didn't have a little bit of this going on at least, right? And though I bestow my goods to feed the poor, and though I give my body to be burned and have not charity, it profit me nothing. So would you expect a baby Christian to, to, to march gleefully into martyrdom? See? See how, see how this works? If you put love in there, we'll, we'll keep going. Charity suffereth long. Well, who's known for being long-suffering? Baby Christians, mature Christians. Uh, charity suffereth long and is kind. Charity envieth not, and charity vaunteth not itself and is not puffed up. Let me tell you something. Baby Christians get puffed up real easy. The Bible says knowledge puffeth up, but charity edifieth. I think it might even say that in this chapter. Rejoice not iniquity, but rejoice in the truth. Beareth all things, believeth all things, hopeth all things, endureth all things. Are baby Christians known for their ability to bear things and believe things and hope things and endure things? They're not. That is the mark of a mature believer. 
1 Corinthians 13 is not a list of things you get on day one. It's a, li- it's a list of things that you develop over decades sometimes of Christian growth. What you're seeing here in 1 Corinthians 13 is the bond of perfection. is the picture of a mature Christian being laid out. Charity never fails. Verse 8. But whether it be prophecies, they shall fail. Whether it be tongues, they shall cease. Whether it be knowledge, they shall vanish away. And it goes on down. Verse 11. When I was a child, I spake as a child. It's interesting that this verse, you know, that people use to, you know, justify putting away an Xbox. Or, and I don't have an Xbox. I don't care. Do whatever you want. You're a grown person. Figure it out. But the ver- this is the verse they use in verse in First Corinthians thirteen eleven. But it's not the context is not, you know, I'm 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 a grown man, so I'm not playing with Tonka trucks anymore. Let me read the verse. When I was a child, I spake as a child, I understood as a child, I thought as a child. When I became a man, I put away childish things. In light of everything else we just read, this is Paul saying when I was, when I didn't have charity. This is what my life looked like. But now that I'm now that I'm a man, I can put away the childish things and I can embrace the, the characteristics of charity found in 1 Corinthians 13. The characteristics of Christian maturity found in 1 Corinthians 13. Verse 12. So now we see through a glass darkly, but then face to face. Now I know in part, but then shall I know even also as I am known. And now abideth faith, hope, and charity. These three, but the greatest of these is charity. So better than faith, better than hope, is charity. Because it's the bond of perfection. It's the mark that you are the sort of Christian that you should be in your growth. That's quite a thing, isn't it? It makes you wonder why the new Bibles get that wrong so much. You know, the King James translators, I mean, they had the word love at their disposal. They had, you know, all that stuff. Everything you have now and then some, they had at their disposal. The, the 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 manuscripts that uh, were accepted the new Bibles were available uh, at least one of them was to the King James translators and they re- rejected that text. But the King James translators through their through just because they're clever or because they're because they're inspired, uh, they they put charity instead of love in First Corinthians thirteen because because they mean different things and those men understood. That charity and love are not the same thing. Charity is love, but love is not necessarily charity. So when you yank charity out of 1 Corinthians 13, you jam love in there. You are you are misrepresenting the attributes of a mature Christian. And you're assigning them to the newest believer. And this is how you should be, baby Christian, right away. Right away, this is how you should be. You should be able to endure all things. Nobody expects that. Nobody has got any sense. Now, I will not say that I am overflowing with charity. But I have more than I did 10 years ago or 20 years ago. And uh, when I look back at some of the things I did that other people tolerated, I can see charity in the life of other Christians. I- I'll give you an example. Um, the-, the church I got saved at had a, um, uh, a little uh, addition. They had a house. The guy who was the head of the military ministry had a house. Let me slow down a little bit. The guy that was head of the military ministry had a house. That house had an addition built onto it. And uh, they uh, th- this... Uh, Addition had bunk beds and, and, and some other stuff. And so the idea was that these sailors, you know, like I was, that uh, did not want to sleep on the ship, they could come there and they could crash there Saturday night. So they would be already at the guy's house and he could, they could ride to church with him Sunday morning. That was the idea. And so I took to stay in there a lot after I got saved. And I got saved. Uh, I was a criminal. And, uh, and so, you know, there's some skills you pick up uh, in that life uh, that you have. And so uh, the, the the typical practice was for uh, the guy who's the head of the military ministry to leave the door on that edition unlocked. Uh, so those guys could drop in. If he wasn't there, they could just go in and make ourselves at home on the on the edition side. We couldn't get into the house proper, but we could get to the edition. <clears throat> so I show up one, one Friday night, one Saturday night, whatever it is, and... Um, they're not there, and the door's locked. So what do I do? I pick the lock. I break in. I make myself at home. Now, they weren't thrilled. The wife especially was not thrilled that this 21-year-old sailor, 22-year-old sailor, had broken into her home and had done it so easily. Um, 
But, you know, for the sake of the ministry, she tolerated me. That is an example of charity exhibited towards the younger Christian. <clears throat> and so there you go. But um, but when you, when, you, when, you, when you present charity as love, you are taking something that is rich and deep and hard fought. You don't get charity overnight. You get charity. You know, this is how it's worked out for me. You get charity. Um, well, let's see. One of the reasons one of the reasons I have more charity than I did before when I was younger. Um, one of the benefits of getting older, and and really, there's not a ton of them. I mean, just everything is just you know, at a certain point in life, you are just walking around in the in the human body version of a high mileage used car. Um, but one of the benefits of getting older is that you you wind up with a better understanding of what a mess you are, and you've learned through repeated bitter failures not to have so much confidence in yourself i really just thought when i was younger and i see this in my i see this in my 18 year old son because in a lot of ways he's just me in a you know different body um i see that i just thought that i could just tough my way through everything because i'm a tough joker i mean i you got no idea but i thought that was enough i thought just how i was just tough enough and hard enough that there was nothing that life could throw at me that I could not handle. There was nothing in life I couldn't conquer if I just applied myself to that. I really believe that, and I still get a little bit of that today. That's male pride, in case you were taking notes at home of my flaws and failings. Um, but, you know, years and years and years of, 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 of different situations, cars broke down the side of the road, bills need to be paid, all this kind of stuff. It teaches you that you don't have it all together, and it, it, it teaches you, it gives you the perspective so you can have more grace with other people. It's one of the things of being a kid. One of the things of being a teenager that's is just so hard is they have no perspective. Everything that's happening is happening to them for the first time. And they just don't always get right away that this is just how life is. Everything's the end of the world because they've never seen it happen before. And you're sitting back in your 30s or your 40s or your 50s or whatever. And you've seen this happen over and over and over again in your life, and the lives of other people, and you're like, this is not that big a deal. Well, it's the same way with Christian maturity. Things that happen to you when you're a baby Christian, you think that, well, this is the first time it's ever happened. I'm the first person it's ever happened to, and none of, none of that's true. I remember I used to sit in Doug Fisher's office, and I would be telling him this story about what was going on in my life, and, and, and he would finish the story for me, and I thought, this man's a genius. What I didn't understand is, no, has he been me? He's been the young military guy who's freshly saved with a lot of bad habits and a lot of, you know, he's been that guy. But not only has he been that guy, he's been counseling people like that for twenty something years. So he's seen it, and so as that he can he can uh, he can offer some grace. I have no idea how to close this out. I'll say this: I believe that uh, this is one more instance, one more occasion in which you can say. That the King James Bible is not only superior to the originals, but that it is superior to any of its competition. Because, like I said, you just those words don't mean the same thing. And when you pull one of them out and stick the other one in, you are you are underselling the concept of charity. You are taking a word that doesn't mean everything that you need it to mean, and you're using it in, sub, in substitute for a word that that that's necessary and needful, and it's the correct word to have there. Well, thank you for listening. Hopefully, this has been edif edifying to you. Edif yeah, sound like Joe Biden. What in the world? Um, hopefully, this has edified you. Hopefully, you can take this and you can think about it. And if you got any questions, you got any comments, you got anything to say, I am not that hard to find. Um, yeah. All right. Well, thank you for your time. And I will see you on the other side.